Great. What a beautiful day. The sun is out here and it feels like it's kind of close to the first time in a week that it hasn't been this crazy flood level rain. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, let me know how you're doing, <clears throat> whether you're jumping on for the live or the replay. Let me know if you're here for the live, drop live in the comments. If you're here for the replay, I drop replay in the comments. <clears throat> We've got a very exciting uh, session on our hands today <clears throat> as we dive into the three-phase <clears throat> economic training plan that Jesus has as he unpacks kingdom economics. So that's going to be amazing. I hope you're doing great. Uh, I've got a couple of um, like just updates really for you little little noticey things um some housekeeping and then we are going to launch right into it so wonderful to have you with us uh looks like everything's streaming where it's supposed to be fantastic yes i can see you guys jumping in uh so say hello as you come in it is just a delight to be with you once again and this is a pretty big deal this is session 12 of 14 so you are doing uh, an ab just you're doing absolutely amazing to have made it this far. So well done, and I really want to congratulate you on your effort, on your hunger, on being here and being present. Because this training that I'm giving, uh, obviously, I'm going all in. I'm not holding back. I'm giving you uh, everything that I can. I'm giving you all the resources that I can as well. And the reason is because we have a massive calling on our hands to disciple nations. And uh, I am 100% fully persuaded that the training that I'm giving is absolutely critical in the process of raising up giant, giant slayers and world changers and reformers and those who have the capacity to disciple nations and for me that's my dream is to see nations discipled so if you uh if you love that idea of seeing nations discipled if you're all in on jesus dream for discipling nations why don't you just drop nations in the comments right this is what we burn for is to disciple nations and if we want to disciple nations we're going to have to actually build that capacity into ourselves uh, to be those who disciple nations and not wait for some other generation to rise up and do it. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what this whole series is about, raising up giant slayers, world changers, reformers, those who have the capacity to disciple nations. So I'm excited for that. Now, uh, this session, right? It's uh, the sacred secret uh, number five, right? <clears throat> we have looked at uh, sacred secret number one, which is extreme ownership. Sacred secret number two, which is uh, identity. Then we did like a, like we touched on sacred secret number seven, which is sacred rhythms um, a little bit of beforehand. So we're actually going to finish with that on our last day on day four, uh, on session 14. And then we did uh, sacred secret number three, which is vision, sacred secret number four, which is relationships. We've just finished sacred secret number five to living in the divine life is, uh, is actually understanding kingdom economics. So say that with me, kingdom economics. I'm going to give you one session right now, but there is a ton, uh, like just a whole bunch more of this uh, available if you want to go deeper so let me just <clears throat> let you know like on the raising royalty platform i'll do a screen share for you here on the raising royalty platform there is oodles of uh, extra content for you here let me refresh this see if it's going to refresh uh here we are on the platform and that's just loading the Raising Royalty platform. Uh, you'll be able to find all these replays here. Oh, look, that's popped up with the Talent Awards uh, info as well. But here, if you come into the Raising Royalty platforms, you can see this coaching and discipleship up here. There's coaching and discipleship. There's the School of Sonship. But if you come in here to uh, coaching and discipleship, 
you're going to find uh, that there's actually all sorts of, of more training available for you here. But specifically, there is the Kingdom Economics uh, Masterclass here. The Kingdom Economics Masterclass is amazing. And what you're going to see in here as well is how uh, Kingdom Economics, one of the things, there's many stories in here, but one that I recommend seeing is how Kingdom Economics became the foundation of the Kingdom of Solomon and how that became the greatest expression of a nation walking uh, in like an on earth as it is in heaven uh, manifestation. So that's wild. Kingdom Wealth Files here by Sebastian Harris, uh, one of my, my partner uh, in, in Raising Royalty is amazing. Okay, so there's just some of the dynamics that are available for you here as well. This Open Heaven Intensive, oh my goodness, that is just lit up. We talked about safe atmospheres, but if you want to look at atmospheres that are actually completely like spark and outpouring this here the open heaven intensive one of the most uh fantastic trainings i've ever done this is actually free you can just sign in and get this once you've this is just sign me out quickly but um that is all worth checking out it's all free to go, go to raisingroyalty.com and you get uh you'll get access there to the platform so i'm going to stop the screen share I just wanted you to be aware that those resources are available if you're liking this. We also have the Seven Streams Challenge, which is something that we present for the Kingdom Business Summit if you want to get uh, premium access to the platform. So there's free, there's basic, which is $37. That gives you the School of Sonship, a whole bunch of other stuff. And then plat, uh, premium <clears throat> gives you Kingdom Business Summit, a whole lot more. But we help people create uh, Seven Streams of income <clears throat> that's one of the things that you'll see and uh there's this beautiful verse that we will talk about today which is uh, from ecclesiastes 11 verse 2 say that with me ecclesiastes 11 verse 2 invest in seven ventures yes in eight because you do not know what disaster may come upon the land so it talks about this the biblical norm is actually to have at least seven streams of income and uh, uh, and it's a really powerful dynamic. So what we've been doing in the Seven Streams Challenge is talking about that and showing people how it's possible to create these automated income streams that are just ticking along for you. So uh, let me know if that's exciting. If you like the sound of that, say exciting. We'll drop seven streams. If you like the idea of having seven streams of income yourself, I'm going to pray. And we're going to tell some amazing stories and we are in for a really exciting session today. Jesus, Holy Spirit, Papa. <laughs> I just thank you for the freedom that you bring into every area of our lives. I thank you that there is a divine blueprint. There is a divine design for every area of our lives to flourish. And Jesus, I thank you that today we get to explore kingdom economics and Jesus, how you taught us kingdom economics. And I'm asking that uh, you would open up our eyes, you would open up our hearts, you would open up our minds, and that you would breathe on us today, that you would breathe supernatural wisdom, that there would be an impartation into our hearts today of supernatural wisdom from heaven that uh, opens us up to understand kingdom economics and how we can uh, not only thrive but lord how we can bring heaven to earth how we can uh, have impact how we can transform lives how we can change uh Lord, things that are injustices and how we can disciple nations and bring dreams to life by through the power of understanding and walking in kingdom economics. Lord, I ask for favor and for blessing and for open doors. <clears throat> I ask for inheritances. I ask for upgrades and raises. I ask for unexpected blessings in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for 
massive financial favor on your people, that you would smile on your people, Lord, that uh, there would be supernatural wisdom and supernatural creativity, and that the anointing on Deuteronomy 8, 18, that it's you, Lord, it's you that gives us the ability to create wealth. Well, Jesus, I'm asking that the ability to create wealth would come upon us, Lord, that there would be spiritual discernment and revelation, that you would break us open to new dimensions and new understandings. Holy Spirit, would you break forth before us and open doors of opportunity like we've never seen before. We love you. We thank you. We bless you. And we welcome you to come and breathe on this time. Holy Spirit, uh, I ask that you would bless the work of our hands. Psalm 127 verse 1 says, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. And I'm asking for every person here, Lord, that you would breathe favor, that you would breathe massive kingdom advance, that you would breathe momentum and breakthrough on their lives. Lord, that there would be debt cancellation. Lord, that inheritances that they didn't even know would begin to open up in Jesus' name. And beyond that, Lord, that there would be an understanding of how to tap into this anointing to create wealth in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, family. Um, drop in the comments. I'm going to use to drop in the comments. Uh, if you think that God thinks uh, money and stewardship of money and wealth is important, okay? So if you think that stewardship of wealth is important in God's eyes, I just want you to drop steward in the comments, all right? And I just want to declare over you, I want you to join with me in making this declaration and saying, I am an amazing steward of wealth in Jesus' name, all right? You want to be a great steward of wealth, and we're going to see that as we go deeper into the, uh, this, this journey today, because in the kingdom, what you steward well will lead to increase. We're going to start today with a story, okay? Um, this is a story about one of my favorite uh, groups uh, and organizations uh, in world history. Now, I just touched on briefly the... Uh, open Heaven Intensive uh, that I that I did recently that's available for you on the platform if you want to go deeper into that. Now, the Open Heaven Intensive has this one of the most powerful, I think it's actually the most powerful story since Jesus of someone who's been able to create an open heaven and disciple nations through the power of what they carried and, uh, and the ministry that they had. And that was St. Patrick. So if you want to go deeper in understanding St. Patrick's story and how he shifted the entire atmosphere of a nation, if you want to go deeper on that, then uh, check out the Open Heaven Intensive. My second group of people, right, who are like the most probably I think one of the most influential groups that has ever lived and who have uh, been one of the most <clears throat> successful groups of people ever at uh, discipling nations has, was a group uh, from London called the Clapham Saints or the Clapham Sect. Let me know if you've heard just um, if you've heard of the Clapham Saints or the Clapham Sect, drop that in the comments, say, yep, I've heard of these guys. Okay, so they're the Clapham. Now, the, now Clapham, it's kind of like that. It's uh, C-L-A-P-H-A-M. So like clap and ham. Uh, Clapham was a, is a street in London, okay? And so the original founders of the Clapham Saints were actually from the Clapham Street Anglican Church. Uh, so... Um, the, the original founder was a guy named Henry Venn, okay? And they founded it in 1780. So it's the Clapham Saints from London in 1780. And the original founder was a guy named Henry Venn. And he was the vicar of Clapham Street Anglican Church. So let me give you a little bit of context of uh, what London was like in 1780. This is the days of full-blown slavery, okay? So nearly all of the parliament and those connected to parliament 
in London, you're in, in England, were on the take from slavery, okay? They were making a lot of money from slavery. They also had another enormous, multi, like just massive conglomerate business that had a huge impact on, uh, on the whole world at that time. It was called the East India Trading Company. Now, the East India Trading Company, they had, uh, ex like they had a lot of power, a huge amount of power, to the point that you couldn't go into East India Trading Company territory without a pass from them. Uh, so places like India, which was overseen by the East India, Ter uh, East India Company, they, they were the ones that had to grant you a permit, a pass to go somewhere if you wanted to go there. And they basically didn't give passes to missionaries because they thought that missionaries were bad for business. So these were two major issues of the day is that there was this huge company uh, that was quite corrupt and it was like not uh, not standing for the Jesus or uh, it was actually actively opposing the spread of the gospel and the spread of missionaries and and slavery. So these are hu two huge issues of the day. And the Clapham Saints, they came up with this dream worth dying for all right it was it was a wild dream a crazy dream they decided that it was their dream they were going to take on this assignment from heaven to eliminate slavery right to abolish slavery and to uh, advance the gospel by sending missionaries that was their two big things the mobilization of missionaries to advance the gospel and the ab abolition of slavery in their day uh, let me know if you think that's a pretty big deal, right? Uh, taking on, basically, they wanted, they wanted to change the fabric of reality. They wanted to change the whole political system. They wanted to change the business uh, system. They wanted to change everything about their culture and society. Like so much would have to change to pull those two dreams off. Now, you might not have heard of Henry Venn or William Thornton, uh, or you know some of these guys who are actually influential in the startup of the Clapham Saints, but um, just imagine with me for a moment, okay? Imagine with me a group of extreme, radical, laser-focused entrepreneurs and visionaries with wealth, power, influence, time, energy, unity, and conviction stronger than steel. All right, now that's what you've got in the Clapham Saints. Initially, they were just a smaller group of people, um, but then that you know they, they started to grow, right? Because people started to buy into this cause, buy into this vision, this dream that they had. And so people were like, yes, let's, uh, let's abolish slavery. And yes, let's advance uh, the gospel with a movement of missionaries are like, yes, let's get behind this. And people started uh, coming on board and they actually recruited a guy that you might know, you might have heard of William Wilberforce. Now, William Wilberforce is the guy who's known as the major abolitionist who, uh, who brought down slavery in England. Well, it was actually the Clapham Saints who were the kind of pardon the pun, but they were the force behind Wilberforce and they got him there, they helped him out and they provided like this massive uh, movement among the people that actually really brought so much weight behind Wilberforce and what he was doing. Um, so a little bit about the Clapham Saints, right? They, they started, like, I mean, they started growing. They had those two big dreams, but then what happened is the organization started growing is people had all these other dreams and they came up, they basically em, em, embraced this concept that has very, very seldom been seen or well implemented in world history, which is a group of Christians that got together and, and their and as they got together, their heart was to help bring each other's dreams to life. So you had bankers and you had evangelists and you had vicars and you had writers uh, and you had, um, you know, you had yeah, missionaries and adventurers and sailors. Uh, you had like people from every area of society started coming together with this heart to help bring each other's dreams to life. And they, 
they realize the power of bringing dreams to life because they realize, hey, we want to change um, abolition. You know, we want to you know end slavery. We want to spark a movement of um, missionaries. But in order to do that, we're actually going to have to change the fabric of our culture and society. And they realize, look, we've all got these different dreams. There's slightly, you know, I've got a dream over here, and I've, you've got this dream over here. And they realize that if we work together to help each other bring our dreams to life. This is actually going to be the process that will bring our real big dreams to life. And they, there's a statement that, that I like to make, which is fulfilled dreams, disciple nations. And this group, the Clapham Saints, were one of the first groups and, and possibly the, the best example in world history of a group of people coming together and going, hey, let's serve each other to bring our dreams to life. And they understood the power and the, behind the statement fulfilled dreams, disciple nations. So drop that in the comments with me. Fulfilled dreams, disciple nations. So uh, here's what they accomplished, right? They started over 200 organizations. Uh, they launched, so they ended up actually abolishing slavery. It took them 30 years to actually get to that point of, uh, of abolishing slavery. And the notice came through. It actually finally got done. And uh, William Wilberforce got the you know, he, he got the news that uh, finally, after over 30 years chasing it down, uh, slavery had been abolished in, uh, in England, in the United Kingdom. And three days later, he died. It was his life's work. How wild is that? So they abolished slavery. They managed to actually change the charter in the East India Company. Now, that took them 30 years as well, right? It took them 30 years to change the charter. One of the things that they had to do to change the charter in the East India Company to permit missionaries to go into those territories, well, they actually gathered handwritten copies of over half a million signatures and they brought them in this petition with over half a million handwritten signatures and dumped it on the, you know, in parliament and said, hey, the people want to see this change. And that was one of the uh, elements, really amazing story, but they got the charter changed and they sparked a movement of missionaries and their missionaries went all around the world. They went to uh, Africa and there's tens of millions of people in Africa who trace their spiritual lineage back to uh, the, this movement of people. Um, same with India, Australia, New Zealand, the, um, all over the world, there are missionaries. In fact, the spread of the Anglican Church, the organization that they started was called CMS, the Church Mission Society, which was the uh, missions department of the Anglican Church. So anywhere around the world that you see an Anglican Church that spread, that was the legacy of these guys. Um, so <laughs> pretty huge. There's literally tens of millions of people around the world who trace their spiritual uh, lineage back to the missionary efforts uh, of the Clapham Saints. So um, they, yeah, they mobilized over 9,000 missionaries through their movement to date. It's still going. Um, they reformed the legal system in England. Uh, at the time, there was over 200 reasons why you could receive the death penalty. Well, they brought legal uh, change and reformation. They brought it to Eight, you know, brought it all the way down to only eight reasons why you could receive the death penalty. Um, they were influential in founding the University of London. Um, they reformed the prison system. They started the SPCA. Uh, they, I mean, they just reshaped culture and society, all the seven spheres of influence that you can think of. They did Sunday school. They looked after women. They looked after, um, you know, abused women. They looked after everyone it was phenomenal what they accomplished and you know it was this group uh you know it was just this diverse group of people vicars lawyers politicians housewives explorers bankers celebrities activists missionaries writers evangelists apostles creatives philanthropists uh, reformers revivalists animal lovers bankers they just all came together and stood for this cause together and they had this belief that fulfilled dreams disciple nations and they ran with it and as a result uh, they saw some of the greatest impact that the world has ever seen you think about the impact that they had of abolishing slavery 
right you know they came head to head with slavery in its biggest day and they slayed that giant of slavery and changed world history so <laughs> if you're grateful for the clapham saints just say yay drop yay in the comments that is a big deal what they accomplished and this there's this uh, the heart of raising royalty which is our movement and this is our mission statement is that we are a movement of kingdom royalty discipling nations through fulfilled dreams so say that with me a movement of kingdom royalty discipling nations through fulfilled dreams and uh because we so we believe in this statement so much that fulfilled dreams disciple nations we've really looked into this and gone okay what are the three reasons why dream uh, what are the main reasons why dreams don't come to life and three reasons stand out um, more than anything else one is people are living in an identity crisis so that's why we've been hammering sonship and identity and the theology and the psychology that actually brings people back into their sonship and uh, resolves identity issues the second one is a lack of vision skills and so that's why we've written the book you know I wrote the book the science of dreams provided that opportunity to do the 40-day focus package for people, uh, you know, a place where people can actually create a personalized precision vision plan to bring their personal dreams to life. Um, and then the third area, which is so massive in just wiping out dreams, is the area of poverty. Now, let me ask you this question. If you had a truckload more cash, would you be bringing more of your dreams to life? You know, if, if you had infinite resources at your disposal, would you be bringing more of your dreams to life? Would you change anything about your life? Would Is there someone that you would bless? Is there a cause that you would support? Is there a, a dream that you would back? Is there a place that you would go, people you would impact, lives that you would touch if you had unlimited resources? My suggestion is the answer is, Yes, that if and I want to I want to suggest to you strongly that the world would be a better, brighter place. That it would be a better, brighter future if your dreams came alive in the future. If, you, if your dreams were out on display, uh, flourishing and coming alive, the world would be a better, brighter place. And so I'm like, right, I know that we can we can uh, we can disciple nations through fulfilled dreams. So we have to come up with solutions to these three things. And so today we're going to touch on kingdom economics because kingdom economics is the solution to poverty and to uh, actually stepping into the economic freedom that brings dreams to life. I don't know if you know this, but uh, poverty is a real big deal across the globe, right? And it's not just uh, in, you know, in your household, it's everywhere. It's massive. You know, 3 billion people live on $2 US a day or less. Three billion people, that's, the, that's what they live on, $2 a day or less. Uh, poverty is huge. And I don't want anyone to uh, kind of get caught in this trap of thinking poverty is a blessing. Poverty is a curse from the pit of hell, and it's out there to destroy. Millions of children die every year because they don't have good water. And that's a problem that could be solved right now just like that, right, if we wanted to. The reason it's not being solved is because the people who steward the wealth are quite wicked, and they could resolve that issue right away if they wanted to. There's enough money uh, being stewarded by the wicked that they could resolve that and have clean water um, by the end of the year for everyone on the planet, but they don't want to. They're quite happy with people in suffering, uh, so that's why it's really important that people understand kingdom economics and step into that. And we start stewarding that so we can actually break the power of poverty off and bring change. And, uh, you know, like, remember one of the, the keys that we've looked at so far in vision is that it's the nature of love to outdream darkness. It's the nature of love to outdream darkness. And your dreams, your wildest dreams, your little dreams, all of your dreams are a part of this beautiful tapestry of dreams that God has placed in the hearts of his people all over the earth. And this tapestry of dreams is designed to come alive, to provide synergy and momentum to one another and to create authentic expressions of heaven all over the earth. And that's going to look like bulldozing poverty away and bringing freedom and transformation. So let's jump into... Uh, 
we're going to jump into just in a moment the three phase economic training plan that Jesus taught. Now, did you know, yes or no, did you know that Jesus had a three phase training on kingdom economics? Drop yes if you did, no if you didn't, and drop um, drop something. Just let me know in the comments if you've actually heard uh, before the three phase economic uh, kingdom economics training plan that Jesus had. I'm asking you that because I haven't heard of anyone else teaching this, but it's clear as day and you're going to see, uh, see it very shortly. To, to start, as I go in there, um, I want to share with you like where we were at probably only five years ago. Uh, and I want you to be thinking about this concept as we get started is that um, if you want change, you're going to have to take massive action. But you also remember that one of the keys that we've been highlighting in this series is that sometimes massive action looks like incremental, sustainable change. And that's where things happen for us. Uh, some of the things that I'm going to be teaching you in this session really collided with us, you know, just over five years ago, six years ago, it started to really hit home and we're like, wow. Uh, this is a big deal. And where we were at the time is I'd been living for years as a full-time uh, volunteer. I think by that time I was starting to get paid by the church. I'd kind of actually raised the support, uh, a lot of that support myself and not getting paid a lot, but we're getting paid a little bit. So we kind of had a little bit of income, which is a lot more than what we'd had uh, for years before that. Now, we, we lived in this place, which was the realm of provision, and we saw God providing everything that we needed, everything that we needed for um, missions, events, and advancing the gospel, and preaching, and just kind of like just surviving. We had that, but there's a difference between the realm of provision and the realm of promise. Now, the realm of promise is a place of Ephesians 3.20. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all that you've ever did to ask, dream, pray, think, or even imagine. Well, we weren't living anywhere close to that. We were just, we were living, we were parked up on struggle street in the survival mode. And we were a long way out of alignment with biblical wisdom around finances. And what did that mean? That meant that for us, the credit card was uh, pretty close to constantly maxed out. We'd have the credit card maxed out at you know, as much as it could get to and uh, and have no idea how we were going to pay that off and also no idea how we were going to put food on the table, how we were going to pay uh, the bills. It was like, oh my gosh, we were stuck in this place that a lot of people get stuck in where um, our living expenses were so much more than our income. I've got a friend, David Rudell, and he has a quote. He says, if your outgoings exceed your incomings, your upkeep will be your downfall. And that's exactly where we were. Our outgoings exceeded our incomings and our upkeep was our downfall. Um, in New Zealand, the average person lives, and this has probably gone uh, a lot worse now with inflation, but the average person even a, a couple of years ago, before inflation was really kicking in, lived off 113% of their income, right? You can, if you're living off 113% of your income, you're going backwards. The Jewish uh, people have this saying of living as a circle inside a square, right? Which is kind of about like living off around 80% of your income, like 79% of your income. A circle inside a square takes up about 79% of the space. And, uh, and if you look in the Old Testament, they always, one of the things they did was they didn't take, they didn't harvest the corners of their square paddocks. They gave that away. That was kind of like their tithes and their offerings and their taruma. Um, so we were stuck in this place where each week we were like, ah, how's this going to work? And, you know, that led to like tears. Like I can't remember how many tears, not really a cry, but Alana, whilst the pressure would come on, she would be in tears. That added pressure on our marriage and stress there for her. Um, and it was this, we would see like when we really needed stuff, we would see God come through all the time. And we were pulling off some major faith things as well. We would like risk our house um, to believe for breakthrough. And we'd, you know, we'd go we'd put all, it all in for running conferences and, and just doing whatever. Um, we, and we saw amazing breakthroughs. It was amazing. Um, but we really were on struggle street with our own 
finances and it was it was really a terrible terrible time and then what happened is we encountered the the uh, we began, began to discover what i'm going to share with you now which is the fact that jesus taught kingdom economics and he had a three-phase kingdom economic training plan that if you actually begin to take massive action and implement you know like incremental sustainable change you can actually see a complete reformation in your uh in your economy and you know for us that meant that you know in the last year because we've 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 kept on doing this incremental sustainable change we've had in mind solomon's wisdom ecclesiastes 11 2 which is invest in seven ventures yes and eight because you do not know what disaster may come upon the land we've been able to go from just complete struggle street to uh, multiple streams of income and you know launching businesses and investments and all sorts of things that are now producing really abundantly and definitely now we've gone from struggle street to ephesians 3 20 where we're actually living in this place of God is doing exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all that we ever did to ask, dream, pray, think, or even imagine. I promise you that I didn't even, I never even imagined that we could be where we are right now. Uh, it, it literally was never in my imaginings that we could be where we are right now, my whole life, until we're even living it now. Even now, we're just like, wow, God, this is crazy what's happening. So let me share with you the key that's been able to make that happen for us and how that's blessed our marriage, blessed our dreams, and it's bringing dreams to life all around the world. It's all possible because of Jesus's three-phase econo uh, kingdom economics training plan. So come with me and uh, let's get into phase one. So say phase one, all right? Say phase one. Yes, phase one. Phase one of Jesus's three-phase kingdom economics training plan is economic alignment okay say that with me economic alignment our first uh, our first verse is going to be matthew 6 verse 24 and jesus said no one can serve two masters either you will hate the one and love the other or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other you cannot serve both god and money and the reason you can't serve both god and money is because you were called to serve God and rule over money. All right, say that with me. Serve God and rule over money. Serve God and rule over money. Let's turn it into a declaration right now. I serve God and I rule over money in Jesus' name. I'm going to declare this over your life right now. You serve God and you rule over money in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, money isn't your friend. It's not your enemy. Money is just neutral the issue in our relationship with money is not money it's us right uh, and in jesus three-phase kingdom economics training he teaches us how to be free from the two ways that uh, we can enslave ourselves to money okay so say that with me there's two ways that we can enslave ourselves to money and we're going to talk about the first one right now so that the first phase of Jesus training on kingdom economics is teaching us how to be free from the first way that money tries to enslave us. And the first way that money tries to enslave us is by becoming an idol. Now, an idol, uh, you don't actually have to go and like build something and create something for it to become an idol. But an idol is anything at all that you, you have place in higher value than God or his word or obedience to God, all right? Anything at all in, in your world that comes, you know, that comes between you living in a place of total surrender and radical obedience, anything that stops you from doing that, it's like, oh, that's more important than total surrender. That's more important than radical obedience. That right there is an idol. Uh, so, Money becomes an idol when we place a higher value on money than we do on walking in total surrender or radical obedience to God. So what you see with Jesus and his parables and his stories uh, and the way he interacted with people and the money conversations that he had is that sometimes Jesus asked people to make big financial sacrifices. And when he did that, it was less about 
uh, the money and it was more about the people's hearts. And he used money to expose people's hearts and to expose people to to what they really believed and what their value systems really were. If people, if someone had an idol in their heart and they'd placed, uh, turn money into an idol, Jesus knew a real simple way to expose that idol so they could see the state of their own heart. And he would just say to them, oh, hey, why don't you give everything away? And all of a sudden they'd go, ah, because uh, money was more important to them than radical obedience to Jesus. Now he didn't ask everyone to do that, but when he knew that someone had an idol in their heart, uh, he would be, you know, had turned money into an idol. He would just expose that. And remember one of the things we talked about earlier about the pearl of great price. What's the pearl of great price to walking in the divine life? The, the pearl of great price is the one that it's going to cost you the one thing you're not willing to pay until you're willing to pay it all. And Jesus is looking for those people who will live in radical obedience and total surrender, who are willing to pay the pearl of great price to lo- live in the divine life. And anyone who wasn't willing to pay the price, he'd expose their hearts. And especially if it was money, he'd say, oh, why don't you give all your money away then? And all of a sudden the idol would be exposed right there for everyone to see. Now, if we would compromise our relationship with God for the sake of money, then the way we think about money is ruling over us. And the highway to freedom from money is a pure heart and a pure mind that ascribes the correct value to money, all right? You get an idol when you ascribe the wrong value to something, okay? You get an idol when you ascribe more value to something than you do to God and then you do to obedience to God. So money has to be brought into a place of alignment where you ascribe the correct value to it, which is way, 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 way below uh, God and way below radical obedience and total surrender. So say with me, pure heart and a pure mind that ascribes the correct value to money. If you've got a pure heart and a pure mind, you will be able to rule over money. If you haven't got a pure heart and a pure mind, money will rule over you. Remember, you cannot serve both God and money because you were created to serve God and to rule over money. And this is what Jesus wants you to be able to do, not just like survive financially. He wants you to rule and reign over money. But he understands you must have a pure heart and a pure mind to do that. Now, if we do end up getting enslaved to money, which a lot of the world is, then it produces all of these like, dysfunctional behaviors, right? So it produces greed, pride, idolatry, poverty, and rebellion. And our value for money can begin to then control our thoughts, our feelings, our motivations, and our behavior uh, as money kind of corrupts us and begins to rule over us. So Jesus wants purity in heart and mind in our relationship with money because only a pure heart and a pure mind can actually rule and reign over money. Now, um, it doesn't actually matter how much money you've got, right? It can be a little bit or it can be a lot. But if you haven't got a pure heart, money will rule over you. Even if you've got, even if you're in a place that you only have a little bit of money, it doesn't, it's not about the amount of money. It's about the purity of your heart and your mind that will determine whether or not run, money will rule over you. And you can have all the money in the world and still be a slave to money because you haven't ascribed the correct value to money. It's still an idol. And therefore, because it's an idol, and your heart isn't pure and your mind isn't pure in your relationship to money, even if you've got all the money in the world, money will still rule over you and make you a slave until you uh, put the correct value uh, on money and ascribe it its correct value and put it in its correct place, which is you ruling over it. Um, yeah, so this is uh, like in this phase of like phase one, okay? So say with me, phase one. In phase one, Pretty much all the teaching that Jesus is doing is about having a pure heart and a pure mind in our relationship to money. So let me just rattle off a few of the classic um, verses around this. Seek first his kingdom. Blessed are the poor. Do not store up for yourselves treasures. No one can serve two masters. Sell your possessions. Give to the needy. 
Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? It is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Be on your guard against all covetousness. Out of her poverty, she put in all she had to live on. If you would be perfect, go and sell what you possess and give to the poor. So all of these things that Jesus is talking about, they're all connected to the first phase of Jesus training on money. And that first phase is about learning to rule over money by having a pure heart and a pure mind. Now, let me give you four lessons that we're supposed to learn from all of this phase one teaching. Okay, four lessons that we should learn from these verses on maintaining a pure heart and mind in our relationship with money are. Number one, say number one. Number one is don't let money become an idol by putting more value on money than you put on your relationship with God and total surrender and radical obedience to God. Number two, you can't take your money with you when you die, okay? So use it to create a legacy that expands the kingdom of God and produces a heavenly return that will bless you in eternity. And number three, you should learn that God loves extreme generosity. And number four, you should learn that God is always thinking about the poor and how to help people break free from poverty. Sweet. Let me give you three traps to avoid, okay? In his phase one economic training, Jesus highlighted three common money traps that we need to avoid, okay? So the first one is don't lose sight of eternity. (laughs) Um, Matthew 6.33 says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. So in the midst of all your day-to-day hustle and grind and paying your bills and financial planning, Jesus wants to ensure that we never lose sight of the fact that we can't take our money into heaven. He teaches us to steward all our finances with an eternal focus. And this looks like walking in purity of heart and mind in our relationship with money and always ensuring that obedience to Jesus is our first financial priority. Okay. Um, Jesus doesn't want to just be your savior. He wants to be your Lord, right? There's a famous Keith Green quote. He said, if he's not, uh, it just talks about um, if he's not your Lord, he's not your savior. In a sense, he, Jesus, that's, uh, that's a Keith Green quote anyway. It's like, if you're not walking with Jesus as your Lord, you're not going to experience the fullness of the divine life, right? If you're, if you're, if you're a slave, If if you put Jesus in a place of lordship, it'll actually put you in a place of freedom. Whereas if you live in a place of idolatry, you'll live in a place of freedom, uh, of bondage and slavery. Walking in a place of purity in our relationship with money and heart and mind looks like Jesus having leadership over our financial decisions. That's a big deal. Okay, number two, don't let money become an idol. This is the second trap that Jesus wants us to avoid. So in Mark 10, he had a conversation with a rich young ruler, right? One of the issues that Jesus highlights with the young man is how he has allowed money to become an idol in his life and that uh, that it has a higher priority to him than obedience to God. So Mark 10, uh, verse 21 and 22, looking at him, Jesus showed love to him and said, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But he was deeply dismayed by these words and he went away grieving for he owned much property. That bit there makes me a little bit laugh, uh, makes me laugh a little bit. Uh, He went away for he owned, uh, he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. And it wasn't the fact that he had lots of wealth that made him cry or sad. It was the fact that Jesus actually exposed that his wealth had become an idol. And so he went away sad, like, oh, the, and what, what was really that about? It's like, hey, the price is too high to follow Jesus. That's what it was about. And the price was only too high because he had made money an idol. All right, sweet. Number three, um, the third trap that Jesus doesn't want us to fall into is um, taking our identity from our wealth, okay? 
whether you have a lot of money or a little bit of money, Jesus wants us taking our identity from him and not our bank account. That's a big deal, right? Never take your identity from your bank account. After his conversation with the rich young ruler, Jesus continued talking about money and began dealing with the issue of people taking identity from their wealth. That's what the Mark 10, 25 is about. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Uh, so the eye of the needle, let me know if you knew this already. Say, so, yeah, I knew that. Uh, the eye of the needle was a narrow gate into Jerusalem. So to get through the eye of the needle, camels had to kneel down and unload all their possessions, right? All the burdens, all the things that they were carrying, they had to kneel down and unload all of those and crawl through. So the issue that Jesus was addressing here is that people had bound their values and their identity to their wealth. And if they wanted to step into the freedom offered in the kingdom of God, they would have to let go of and unload their false beliefs, their pride, and their false definitions of their identity attached to their financial status. So they would have to detach from the lies and lay them down in the same way that a camel, which was loaded with all these burdens, had to detach and lay down and come to this place of humility, laying down all these false definitions uh, of their identity that was attached to their wealth, and then crawl through on their knees through the eye of the needle. That's really what Jesus was talking about when he said going through the eye of the needle in the context of you know, rich people, it was harder for them to enter the kingdom of God than it is for a camel to, let, to get through the eye of a needle. Why? Because uh, they just aren't willing to let go. The camel can get through because it's willing to lay down, it's willing to surrender, it's willing to let go of those false, uh, you know, of all its baggage. But the rich people weren't willing to get humble. They weren't willing to let go. They weren't willing to surrender their false definitions and crawl through the place of humility. So that's what Jesus was highlighting there. Um, and the key thing, right, that we, we really want to understand from Jesus' phase one teaching on kingdom economics is that his focus is purity of heart and mind um, because we can be enslaved in our thinking about money, whether we have a little or a lot, if, uh, if our hearts and minds aren't in the same alignment with Jesus' value systems around money. Now, Jesus has no problem at all with money he just wants to ensure that for us our priority is radical obedience and total surrender and that money is a distant second to living in a place of radical obedience and total surrender all right that's phase one done we're hitting phase two now okay so say phase two with me economic assignment all right economic assignment the first one was economic alignment the second one is economic assignment uh, you're going to kind of see this theme with Jesus all the time and uh, when he's teaching things. And when you actually start to see these patterns, you start realizing, oh, that's what he's doing here. That's what he's teaching. That's what he's saying. But he always teaches alignment before assignment. OK, it's always with Jesus. It's always alignment before assignment. OK, so remember in Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So we cannot serve both God and money because we're called to, you've got this now, serve God, right? So drop in the comments, serve God and rule over money. So drop in the comments, rule over money. So we serve God and we rule over money. And most of what Jesus taught us about was ensuring that our hearts and our minds were pure so that money couldn't rule over us by becoming an idol. But there's two ways that money will rule over us. And the second way that money will rule over us is if we don't have any, okay? So in, uh, now things change, right? In Jesus' teaching. You, and you see this shift in, uh, in changing from phase one to phase two. It shifts in Luke 19 and, and Matthew 25. After those two points, Jesus stops teaching the phase one stuff and he shifts over to phase two. 
And he doesn't go back to phase one. He's like, right, phase two from here on. So Matthew 25, it shifts. Luke 19, it shifts. And he's gone, he's gone from um, alignment to assignment. Um, now, I don't know if you know this, but did you know that there's a sacred economic assignment on our lives? Drop that in the, drop that in the comments, right? Sacred economic assignment. There is a sacred economic assignment in our lives. And once things get to Matthew 25 and Luke 19, from that point, Jesus is starting to help us engage with the sacred economic assignment on our life and to steward that. And it really, uh, there's a really significant test, a really significant stewardship test going on in our lives uh, where Jesus is testing us to see how we're stewarding our finances. Because Jesus wants us to rule and reign over money in two ways, all right? He wants us to have pure hearts and minds so that the way we think about money doesn't control our feelings, our thoughts, our motivations, and our actions. And he also wants us to steward wealth with biblical wisdom so that finances don't control our time or our resources, okay? Jesus wants us to be free in all areas of our lives. That's good news, right? So in the second phase of Jesus' training on kingdom economics, Jesus is not teaching us about purity of heart and mind. That's done, okay? He's moving on to something different now, which is wisdom of our principles and systems, okay? Say this with me, wisdom of our principles and systems, uh, Sebastian Harris, um, a business partner and uh, co-founder of Raising Royalty, he has a classic saying, which is a quote from James Clear um, in his book on atomic habits, which is, we don't rise to our goals, we fall to the level of our systems. And what Jesus is teaching us here is biblical wisdom, right, of principles and systems around kingdom economics. And the reason he's teaching us um, biblical wisdom for financial and economic principles and systems is because the second way that we become slaves of money is if money can control our time and our resources, right? If we don't have money, if we have to get up uh, every day and go to work just to get money, that means that money is controlling us. And Jesus actually has biblical wisdom that he's teaching us here that enables us to become independently wealthy and financially free if we really listen in to what he's saying so let's pay attention because who wouldn't want that in order to become money's master and to rule over money and to be truly free from money controlling our time and our resources we must apply biblical systems and principles and let me give you one reason why it's worth leaning in here i'm actually reading this book at the moment here by uh pastor sunday uh at elijah so he, uh, this book's called Money Won't Make You Rich, but one of the amazing stories in that book is that God challenged him to really sort things out. His heart and mind around money was good, but his principles and systems weren't good. So God's saying, hey, sort these things out. And so he did, and he made a goal to make a million US dollars within uh, a year, and he did it in nine months. And then within less than three years, he'd raised up over 200 millionaires in his church. And this is in the Ukraine, right? And these were people who were, you know, ex-criminals, ex-drug addicts, people off the street, people out of prison, people who didn't have uh, economic understanding or wisdom, but he taught them biblical principles and systems on kingdom economics. And within less than three years, had raised up over 200 millionaires in his church pretty phenomenal so maybe just maybe what jesus was teaching has some relevance and has some power and has the ability to bring us into a place of um of impact and fruitfulness like we never knew before so let's jump into a couple of parables where jesus taught about our sacred economic assignment so firstly let's look at matthew 25 uh and the parable of the talents, okay? So first, some context, right? Um, these servants are all about to be given a talent, and a talent 
was 18 kilograms of gold. So it was about 20 years wages. So when they were being given a talent, that's a pretty big deal. Uh, so verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold. Okay, that's five talents. So that's like a hundred years wages. <laughs> it's like, that was like a million, a million dollars. To another, two bags and to another, one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. So you can see here already that these servants have been weighed and tested according to their ability and based on their level of stewardship and excellence, they're now receiving opportunity based on their level of excellence and stewardship. So that's worth noting. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one who... Uh, the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. So one of the first things that we notice uh, here is that this whole parable is highlighting an investor's mindset. So say that with me, an investor's mindset. The money is making money, all right? So there's four investors in this story at this point. The first investor is the owner of the gold. Then he makes three investments into, sorry, he makes three investments into three servants, commissioning each of his servants to become investors, okay? So this is money making money. So you, you want to say that, okay? Say that with me. Money making money, right? Then he goes on his journey with the expectation that while he is away doing his thing, his money will be making money for him. And it's important to note that he gave his servants a long time to produce a return. So it's time and money are the two most important elements to investing, okay? Those are two of the most important elements is time and money to determine a return. So the next thing to note is that this servant uh, grew in favor with the master based on how he stewarded his sacred financial assignment. Now, um, by the way, God does not, uh, growing in favor doesn't mean that God is going to love you more. It doesn't going to be mean that you're going to uh, be made more in his image. It doesn't mean that you're going to be included more um, or accepted more, but it does mean that you will have greater access to kingdom resources, okay? Even Jesus grew in favor with God and man. It's not getting more loved uh, or more uh, identity, but you do receive greater resources, as you grow in your stewardship, there is a reward. So verse 22, the man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The second servant uh, also produced a great return. Yeah, fantastic. Okay. And, his, and he grows in favor with his master as well and is rewarded for successfully investing and stewarding the sacred financial assignment on his life. So verse 24, then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I know that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. Woo, those are pretty heavy words, right? You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. 
So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more. And that's what, what does he have? He has favor. So whoever has favor will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, who doesn't have what? Favor. If you don't have favor, even what you have will be taken from you and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Ouch, right? What a burn there. So um, the third servant, right? He is really relevant to us. And uh, that... That line there, that that burn uh, that the third servant got in the parable is actually the same burn that um, God gave Pastor at Elijah, right? And that was one of the things that started his journey is God really convicted him and said, you wicked, lazy servant. Like, ah! Now, it's not like he was wicked and lazy. He was like pouring his life out. He was hustling, but he wasn't stewarding the sacred financial assignment on his life very well at all and God busted him on him and said you wicked lazy servant and uh, pastor Sunday at Elijah was like ah what do you mean God I'm doing my best and he said well look you actually have uh you might be doing your best but you're I'm calling you a wicked lazy servant because you haven't understood the principles right and basically it's like you're being like that wicked lazy servant where you're burying uh, the the rewards and you're not actually stewarding it for an increase. And if we look back here, it says, uh, so you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So that servant knew that there were ways, knew that there were systems and knew that the master's money was returning all the time. And one of the things that you can kind of read between the lines here is that success leaves footprints okay now every single day people are making a great return off their investments okay now at the same time every every day people are losing money off investments and investments is a you know place of risk uh, as well as reward but what he's saying here is success leaves footprints and you're wicked and you're lazy because you haven't gone out and figured out how people are actually producing a return and getting a reward from their finances. And you haven't figured that out. You've been lazy and you haven't gone to the effort to like really deep dive and understand kingdom economics and understand investing and understanding how to steward the sacred assignment on your life. And so uh, Pastor Sunday and Elijah was like, ah, God, you got me. So he applied himself, right? He took massive action. Now, sometimes massive action might be like reading a book, doing a course, do our kingdom economics, you know, like do the full kingdom economics masterclass, do the, um, you know, study the uh, kingdom wealth files, check out the seven sacred, uh, like the seven streams to income challenge or the kingdom business summit, but do something where you're going to take massive uh, action to actually understand how you can steward the sacred financial assignment on your life. And so, Pastor Sunday at Elijah, he did, right? He's based in the Ukraine. That's not known as the world of opportunity. It only took him nine months to make his first 1 million US dollars. That's pretty cool. That's pretty good testimony. So the third servant, right? Recognized that his master had an investing servant. Uh, sorry, <laughs> recognized that his master had an investing mindset. Recognized that that's what was happening, but he failed to uh, take any massive action and go and learn how can I actually get a return off this investment as well. The lazy servant was the servant who didn't apply himself, who didn't take massive action to actually change himself and upgrade his skill set and learn how to steward the sacred financial assignment on his life. Right. So he didn't lose his master's money. You know, like the master was most upset because the servant didn't understand the principles and systems of investing. And that's what Jesus is teaching in this parable, the wisdom of principles and systems in regards to uh, economics and uh, investing. That's why he talked to the. Um, yeah, that's. <laughs> So the big issue, right, for the servant was that the servant did not understand the principles and systems of investing. And that's why the master said he was wicked and lazy, right? 
Um, and this is the same for us, is that God expects us, if we don't know, to take massive action and to grow and to figure these things out so we can come back and be a faithful steward who grows in favor and impact and increase. Um, and I want to say that Jesus takes the sacred financial assignment on our lives very seriously. Uh, we are being tested with our money. And listen, it's really not about the amount at all, okay? It's about stewardship. We are being tested for faithfulness and how well we implement the principles and systems of kingdom economics. All right, uh, next set, uh, next chapter we're going to look at is Luke 19, and it's the parable of the miners. Okay, so say Luke 19 with me. We're changing tack a little bit. Now, um, a miner was much less money than a talent, okay? So a, a, a talent, like in the previous parable, each talent was like a million dollars, right? It was 18 kilograms of gold, 20 years wages, and, uh, and it, was a, it was a lot. Um, a miner was about four months wages, okay? So it's a lot less money. Um, but still, here we go. Let's check out this uh, next parable. Verse 11 in Luke 19. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 miners. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. So here we're seeing again the investor mindset of money making money for you and also receiving a sacred financial assignment. All right, verse 14. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, We don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, sir, your miner has earned 10 more. How wild is that? That is huge. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of 10 cities. Wow. So the master was very interested to know how the servants had stewarded their financial, their sacred financial assignment. And it's interesting to see that the master used the sacred financial assignment on their lives to determine how much influence and favor to bestow on their lives. Um, and this is the same, par like same principle that we saw in the parable of the talents is that faithfully stewarding a sacred economic assignment produces an increase in favor. And this is where it gets really powerful, all right? Uh, and we see the bigger picture of why Jesus is testing us with finances is Jesus is looking for people that he can entrust greater favor and influence to. Favor, dominion, and authority are a reward for stewarding our finances well. Crikey. Okay, verse 18. The second one came and said, Sir, your miner has earned five more. And at this point... Uh, the man's just gone into a profit, all right? So he started out with 10 miners. Um, he went in on adventure and now he's got 15 miners. So his money was making money for him. So he's got a good return off just off the first two guys. Verse 19, his master answered, you take charge of five cities. I want you to say that with me, cities, okay? Uh, this guy is looking for people who will take charge of cities. Verse 20, then another servant came and said, sir, here is your miner. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and you reap what you did not sow. Bum, bum. So uh, we don't hear about these other seven investors, uh, like the other seven servants, right? They're not mentioned, but he has come away with a profit at this point, okay? He didn't lift a finger. His money has done all the work for him. And uh, he started with 10 minus, he's now got six. So this is, his money was making money for him, all right? So it's automated. When you've got your money making money for you, that's actually an automated 
system. And that is an example of how we rule over money through principles and systems. So that's really key, okay? There's two ways that we rule over money, through a pure heart and a pure mind in our relationship with money, making sure there's no idols. That's one way that we rule over money. And it's also one way that we become a slave of money is that if uh, we get, you know, we start giving money a place of, uh, you know, higher place than, than God's got. So money becomes an idol and we become a slave. So that's the way. And then the other way that we rule over money is through like, wise biblical principles and systems that enable us to steward wealth well and produce a return so that uh, we get to tell money what to do rather than money telling us what to do. A wonderful quote um, that I've heard from many good friends is, money is a terrible master, but a wonderful servant. And if we want to be free from money, it requires that we have a pure heart and a pure mind in our relationship with money and that we have an abundance of money so that we are telling money what to do rather than money telling us what to do. That's a big deal. And Jesus wants to set us free from that. And biblical, like wise biblical principles and systems around investing is the key that Jesus is giving for us to do that. So, um, Jesus is like in this parable, Jesus gives us a really clear picture of how to walk in financial freedom, okay? And it's by stewarding our sacred financial assignment. He is creating an investment mindset and an investment culture, all right? I want you to say investment mindset and investment culture. This is Jesus speaking, and he's the one that is intentionally creating an investment mindset and investment culture in his people, all right? He wants us to have an investment mindset and an investment culture. So for Jewish people, like this is their normal, okay? Jewish people don't really need to get taught this. And that's why Jewish people are disproportionately wealthy as they have an investment mindset and an investment culture that produces multi-generational wealth. Okay, um, so I don't know where you're at in your journey around finances. But for us, when we started to hear this, I was kind of like shocked. I was like, what? Investing? I've only ever done things by faith. I don't know about, I really don't know about investing. I haven't really been in this space. Uh, I don't know what to do with it. I didn't really have any spare money either in terms of to do investing. You know, when you're living off, when you're when you're in that place, right, where your weekly costs are greater than your income, it's pretty hard to think about investing, right? So we came across this principle called the principle of the five jars. And this is an ancient Jewish mindset around investing, something that they got from the, you know, from the Old Testament. Um, and I want to share this with you right now. It's called the five jars. Now, it's simple, but it's extremely powerful. And, uh, and if you can start making, if you want to make change, then uh, you've got to take massive action. But sometimes, remember, massive action looks like incremental, sustainable change. So there we were living in a world where we had no money. Our credit cards were backed up. There was lots of tears. There was pressure. Uh, our upkeep, uh, sorry, our outgoings exceeded our incoming so our upkeep was our downfall it was a terrible place to be and then we came across this the five jars principle right so imagine a, a jewish dad teaching his kids about money and they get five jars and each of these five jars is going to get some money put in it so the first jar is the tithing jar and he's like look son if the kid's got a hundred dollars say look or say it's ten dollars right he says look son you've got ten dollars here Let's put 10% in the tithe jar. So $1 goes into the tithe jar. He's like, okay, son, the second dollar goes into the offering jar. So $1 goes into the offering jar. And he's like, the next 10%, right, which is another dollar, goes into the savings jar. Okay, and then he's like, the next 20% goes into the investing jar. And he's like, the last 50% you can spend because that's for living off. Now, that was really challenging and really confronting when we heard that because it's really hard. I mean, we were already tithing and doing offerings. We were really generous with our money. That was awesome. But savings, investing, not so much, right? Those were the things that kind of got cut for us. But um, 
the most important one out of there to actually bring change is, you know, like a uh, firm believer in tithes and, and offerings, you know, like being generous, that's so critical. And then after that, the most important one to actually bring change is investments. But because we didn't have actually any money, you know, it's hard to tithe, like it's easy. So this living off 50%, right? That's crazy. It's really hard to live off 50% of nothing but it's really easy to live off 50% of a huge amount, right? So the dynamic here of taking massive action to create incremental sustainable change, that hit us we were in this space and we're going to, have to do something. So we had to, like one of the things that we had to first start doing is let's really cut back on expenses where we can and see if we can save even just a little bit. Can we save $10 here or $10 there? What can we do to save something to cut back our expenses? We had to stop the bleeding in a sense, right? So we worked really hard to stop the bleeding of our finances. And then we tried to figure out, hey, where can we invest something even just a little bit? So we started making these tiny little investments into things that weren't even that great an opportunity, but it was something that we could get some money into. And, you know, like we just put a little bit of money into there and, and then see what it will do. And over time, what happened is we were able to, you know, just incrementally, sustainably, uh, incrementally and make incremental and sustainable change. So a one degree shift, right? Over, if you if you uh, say you, you've got a gun and you take a shot, right? Now, if you make a shot, if you adjust your aim by one degree over, over time, that makes a big difference at the other end. And so what also happens is when you start making these incremental changes, it's like you get momentum and synergy in each area of your life. So we started like a little change here and a little change here and a little change here. And when we started getting momentum just a little bit by little bit, and then it really started to build and then build and then build. And then we went from struggle street to Ephesians 3.20, exceedingly abundantly above and beyond what we've ever did to ask, dream, pray, think, or even imagine. That's where it really started for us, right? So the five jars again, 10% tithing, 10% offering, 20%, uh, sorry, 10% saving, 20% investing, and 50% for living off. Um, so that is uh, phase one and phase two, right? Uh, that's the that's the recap of it. Phase one is all about having purity of heart and mind in our relationship with finances. And phase two is all about biblical, uh, ancient biblical wisdom that enables us to have systems, right? Systems and principles that and, and make us great investors. And I will say off the back of this, you know, one of the things that Jesus is really talking about here is in this parable, Luke 19, is about cities, okay? Now, if you can, uh, like this, like these uh, these servants here, there's something really powerful that there's kind of like, like hidden between the lines here is that one servant produced a tenfold return, right? He got one miner and he turned one miner into 10 miners. And Jesus says, here's 10 cities. Here's a reality, right? is that if you can consistently turn $1 into $10, you can actually rule over cities. That's something that Jesus was actually saying. Is like, if you can steward wealth like this, where you can turn $1 into $10, you'll consistently rule over cities and you won't be able to just do one city. You'll actually be able to scale up to 10. And so if you can consistently turn $1 into $5, you won't, you know, you'll actually be able to rule over cities with that level of finance because you'll actually just be able to buy the city or you'll be able to build the city. There's so much power and leverage in being able to steward um, finances and produce significant returns, especially the returns that they're turning, talking about, turning $1 into $10 or $1 into $5, that is extremely powerful. You want to look at the power of compounding returns, right? If you can turn, um, if you can, Oh, it's just massive. Okay. So check out compounding returns sometime. We talk about this a bunch in our seven streams challenges and things like that. It gets pretty wild. So uh, that's phase one and phase two done. So I want you to say with me phase three, right? We've looked at economic alignment and then economic assignment. And phase three that Jesus talk, talked about is economic reformation. Okay. Say economic reformation with me. Uh, this is the real fun part, right? Phase three 
is about, okay, sweet. You've stepped into alignment, you know, a sacred financial alignment. You've stepped into your fake, sacred financial assignment. You're stewarding biblical wisdom uh, and principles well. You've got purity of heart and mind. And you are actually, as a result of this, expanding the kingdom on earth as in heaven, right? You're expanding. So uh, uh, at this point, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story and let me do a screen share for you and introduce you to a really lovely character. Okay, just going to clear a couple of things out of the way for you here. And all right. So first up, there it is. Oh, it's just gone into a, oh, well, um, that's, I was hoping it was going to be bigger, but um, I should be able to make it bigger if I go here. Hang on one second. I'll just take a second here to make it bigger in this. Uh, it's not going to go bigger. Sorry, guys. Um, it's just saved in a funny format. But here you go. This is a tiny little picture, especially if you're looking at it uh, on a phone. So this is someone in a brick kiln slave. So I'm going to tell you the story about Mr. Francis. So Mr. Francis was a guy that we connected uh, with. I didn't personally connect with him. Our senior pastor did um, through the missions program that our church was running in Fiordland uh, in Tiano. And this uh, particular guy, Mr. Francis, we connected through our missionary contacts in Pakistan. And Mr. Francis was a brick kiln slave, just like this young lady, his whole family were brick kiln slaves. Uh, basically all they did all day, every day, dawn to dusk was get up and make these bricks for their uh, Islamic, in a sense, kind of like, mm, almost slave owners, slightly different. It's kind of like they get into this debt system where they can't get out and they just have to work a never ending system where uh, they can never get out of the cycle because the debt just keeps increasing. So they're always trapped in there and they've rigged the system so they can never get, get free. So Mr. Francis, he was in this place and his family was in this place. Well, we helped provide a, um, some funds for Mr. Francis to start an, a, a business. Okay, so I stopped my screen share there, but I didn't actually mean to. Um, we provided some funds for him to start the business. So this is his catering business. All right, so he started this catering business. And um, after a while, his catering business started going, you know, started going pretty well, started making a little bit of money. And, uh, and this gets really powerful right here. He made enough money to be able to buy his own wife out of slavery i need to think about that for a moment and just consider how powerful that is that you could buy your own wife out of slavery that you could come out of slavery yourself and then you could buy your own wife out of slavery well he bought his wife out of slavery and the business kept on uh going well and doing well and so he was able to buy his own children out of slavery he went on from that i mean can you just imagine that i don't know if you can imagine that it is just crazy right he bought his wife he bought his own children out of slavery if i try and get my head in that uh space and really meditate on how much impact that would have on him on his life on his family to be bought out of slavery to be free is just mind blowing. Well, he continued to expand. He actually bought all his relatives out of slavery. Uh, he's now like funding other ministries and things uh, in that area and doing really well with his catering business. Well, the reason I'm telling you about that is because that's what phase three is, right? Phase three is economic reformation. That's where you take what uh, you take the wisdom that you've learned, the freedom that you've learned, you've now come through phase one and phase two, you're actually ruling and reigning over money, all right? You've got, you've got uh, 
a pure heart, a pure mind, and you've got brilliant investing mindsets, and you've got brilliant biblical wisdom and principles that are giving you financial freedom, and you're able to go, hey, let's serve this person, let's help this person, let's do this person. So phase three is economic reformation. It's where we actually pass it on, right? It's uh, And where Jesus really talks about uh, the value of this is in Matthew 28, 19 to 20, where he highlights it, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Your sacred financial assignment is a part of the process of making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And listen to this. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Okay, so that is, includes teaching people about how to rule and reign over money. Here, have a pure heart and a pure mind in your relationship with money. Here, have biblical wisdom and systems and investment mindset and investment culture so that you can rule over money. This is a huge part of what Jesus taught and what we're called to carry to the nations as we go and we make disciples of all nations and this sacred financial assignment on our lives is a huge part of that. And I want you to say this with me right now. Say, I have a sacred financial assignment on my life. That's right. God is, uh, he's testing us, right? And it really what he's testing us for is he wants to put us in charge. He wants to increase the level of favor. He's looking for people to, pour, I want to pour out more favor on you. I want to pour out more influence, more dominion, more authority over you. I want to give you the opportunity to rule and reign, not just over money, but over cities. So he's drawing us in, he's calling us like, hey, steward your financial assignment. And as we do, favor increases, opportunities increase, authority, dominion increase, and he actually is really looking for those who will uh, disciple cities, disciple nations, and rule and reign over them. But kingdom economics is such a critical part of that process. So phase three is really exciting. It's about where we bring the impact in, right? It's about where we start uh, making transformations, impacting lives, sparking chain reactions. I mean, it's been so amazing to see all the things that we've been able to, to sow into, um, starting a children's sponsorship program in India, serving uh, our, fan, you know, our, our team in India who have got an amazing children's home over there, serving anti-human trafficking projects, sponsoring missionaries um, all around the world, supporting ministries. It's so exciting, the impact and the power of what can happen when you start gaining momentum financially. So that's phase three is economic reformation where you get to go, oh man, I discovered this amazing teaching. Uh, and look, it's a biblical teaching. Jesus wants us to take that teaching. It's like this teaching. It's like, hey, spread the word, share that, equip people, empower people. And then, hey, what are you going to do now with your finances? Will be like the Clapham Saints, right? Who they pulled together, they worked together as a community, and they understood that fulfilled dreams disciple nations. So they worked together, they brought dreams life uh, to life. And they were a massive part of economic reformation. And as a result, they discipled nations. So, bam, that's the, uh, that's, uh, the three-phase economic training plan that Jesus had. And um, if you go deeper into the Kingdom Economics Masterclass or the Seven Streams Challenge or the Kingdom Wealth Files, you're going to un start unpacking more about things like verses like Ecclesiastes 11.2, which is, Invest in seven ventures, yes, and eight, because you do not know what disaster may come upon the land. Um, I believe that we should all uh, and can all have multiple streams of income working for us 24-7, automated. There's so much opportunity with that now through technology as well. Uh, so I look forward to sharing this adventure with you, um, going deeper on how we can uh, step into the sacred financial assignments on our lives, bring dreams to life, bring your wildest dreams to life, and start to disciple nations through fulfilled dreams together. Uh, so let me pray a blessing on you. And I actually feel like we should make a couple of declarations right now as well. So why don't you make a declaration with me uh, right now? So just repeat after me, and we're going to make this declaration. I rule and reign over money. All right, here we go. 
One, two, three. I rule and reign over money in Jesus' name. I rule and reign over money in Jesus' name. I rule and reign over money in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let me pray for you. Uh, Papa, Jesus, Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are burning to disciple nations. I thank you that you have put enormous, wild, world-changing, world-reforming dreams on the inside of us. I thank you for every single dream that every person here carries. I thank you for the dreams they aren't even aware of yet that you've placed inside of them. And I ask right now that you expand their dreams to, Lord, to really take their dreams beyond what they ever imagined. Would you just uh, bring a bulldozer into mindsets of limitation and just break open whole new dimensions of dreaming with you. Would you cause us to ascend, to arise with you to a whole new dimension of limitlessness and to dream with you? And Holy Spirit, I thank you for every person here. And I thank you that you said in Ephesians 3.20, God is able, God is able, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all that we have ever did to ask dream pray think or even imagine so jesus i'm asking that right now you begin to bring that to life in jesus name lord would you begin to deposit uh, the anointing from deuteronomy 8 18 you have given us the ability to create wealth may that anointing to create wealth come upon us in jesus name lord that we could be those who stand for freedom, that we could be those who uh, empower dreams to come to life, that we could be those who fulfill our dreams and walk in our dreams and disciple nations. Lord, would you take that anointing and that mantle that was on the Clapham Saints and would you put that on us, the ability to outdream darkness, the ability to end slavery, the ability to mobilize for missions. Would you put that that mantle on us, that anointing on us, that dream on us, that heart on us, that fire in us, Lord, that, that we would go, okay, right. We're not going to stand for darkness. We're going to arise and shine. We're going to be the solution. We're going to outdream darkness. Would you put that fire in us, Jesus? And would you connect us supernaturally? Holy Spirit, would you connect us supernaturally with wisdom from heaven, with insights, with understanding, with visions and dreams and encounters and revelation, that you would lead us step by step into this place of mastering the uh, you know, economic alignment and our sacred economic assignments and being those who are mass catalysts of economic reformation all over the earth in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, family, uh, lots of love to you. Uh, I'm really excited for you. You have a sacred financial assignment on your life, and it has the capacity to impact lives all over the world. There's 3 billion people living on $2 a day or less. There's more people in slavery now than there ever was at the height of the African slave trade. Over 27 million people, it's estimated, in slavery today. You and I are called to be the solutions to this chaos. And uh, so I want to bless you as you step into the sacred economic assignment on your life, as you begin to, to grow on that and build on that and build momentum. Um, and I'd love you to just drop in the comments, what's one dream that you would bring alive if you had limitless resources, right? If you had unlimited resources, drop in the comments a dream that you would bring to life. I know that we will be a better and brighter place with your dreams uh, thriving and alive. Uh, in our next session, it's going to be getting very exciting. We are opening up uh, divine health. It's going to be a very, very cool session that we talk about divine health, uh, nutrition, all sorts of amazing stuff and how we can actually step into divine health. So bless you, fam, and I'll see you in our next session. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.